And I've had a bit of an odd career. Uh, I initially went to school to be a physicist. I switched over and became interested in psychology. I dropped out of school in 1970 and came out to live at Esalen in Big Sur during the kind of wild and crazy years. I wrote my first book, Body Mind, when I was 22. And when I was uh, 23, I was asked to head up a co-head up a project to see what was possible in terms of causing or allowing older men and women to rejuvenate or refresh or reinvent. It was called the Sage Project. And um, along the way, I've written 15 more books. I've been a film producer. I've done a number of documentaries and TV movies. And uh, I've given talks to about two and a half million people. I've worked with more than half the Fortune 500. Uh, and I've met with many, many, many of our world leaders uh, all on this issue. So I'm going to try to save you like 39 and a half years. <laughs> because I have made so many mistakes. And there have been so many times I said, wow, why didn't I think of it that way? And what I've come to appreciate is, it's a little bit on the point was being made earlier, uh, separate from telling a story or giving a speech, there is the story of this longevity phenomenon. And what I've come to deeply appreciate is that the way one looks at it is usually uh, both the strength and it's usually what keeps you from seeing all the opportunities. So I'm going to at least try to share with you some of the ways that I look at it. And I'm going to wind up, uh, and then Jody will join me, but I'm going to share with you seven territories that I think are ripe for opportunity, and I'm going to throw in one just for the fun of it. Is everybody OK with that? Good. And I'm, I'm so glad to be here with Mary. Mary is a dear friend and has been for many, many decades. And I, I love this sort of axis that she has created, this, this Nexi zone. So. I'm going to be working with images on the screen. I'm going to move through things relatively swiftly. I know and I've been told that you guys are all uh, hyper smart. So I'll try to just cruise through a number of issues. And I would say that I think all of them are meaningful and relevant when trying to figure out what business opportunities might exist in this new market space. So I'm going to cover four trends, uh, the fourth one being the marketplace itself. The first three being, how does one understand what's taking place? We are in the midst of longevity revolution. I'm sure you're all deeply familiar with this. This is a chart of the average life expectation at birth over the past 1,000 years. And what I'm continually struck by is the fact that throughout all of history, most people didn't age, they died. So in the 1850s, couples didn't say, gee, honey, what technology should we use to make our retirement comfortable? Because you'd be dead. Our medical system didn't need to be expert to things like hypercholesterolemia, osteoarthritis, adult onset diabetes, uh, dementia, because people died young, generally of acute infectious diseases, accidents, trauma, childbirth, before they got old enough to have their bodies wear out. I'm going to click this little device and show you the average life expectation over the past 100,000 years. And here the story gets really quite fabulous, because what we now hear from medical anthropologists is that throughout 99% of all the years that humans have walked this earth, the average life expectation at birth was under 18. So there have always been 40 or 60 or 80 year olds, but not very many. And as you can see, this has never happened before. Everything we're here to explore today, we are at the tip of the spear. This has never happened before. In so many areas of the economy or politics or infrastructure, you can look back at earlier moments in time to see the way things were dealt with before. This one is brand new. One of the impacts of steadily elevating longevity for the masses is that we've got a whole lot of older people around these days. In fact, two-thirds of all the people who have ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. And occasionally people will say, you know, Ken Dykewald, he's talked to more people about aging than any human being in the history of the world, which may be true. And I'll tell you, one of the things I've noticed from all these decades is that most of these older adults haven't a clue what they ought to be doing with their lives. They're the frontiers. They're the pathfinders. They're at the front end of this evolutionary journey. And we, perhaps, are there to enable, to empower, to enlighten, to liberate what comes in this new stage of life. Another interesting point is, and I've heard it all morning today, and yesterday I was at a great session, who are we talking about? 
We're using, I think, this notion of 65 as a marker. And that was selected by Otto von Bismarck in the 1880s when he was crafting Europe's first pension plan. And the average life expectation in Europe and the Americas was 45. So we think of ourselves as very cool, very hip, very futuristic. We're Silicon Valley, we're Bay Area. And yet we're somehow, our minds are anchored or hinged to a notion that was crafted you know, a century almost and a half ago. By the way, if we were to use the same Bismarckian model today, we'd be retiring people at 98. So what does 65 look like anymore? Well, Sophia Loren uh, was 65 when this picture was taken. Uh, and just to give you a frame of reference, when Whistler painted his mom, she was right around the same age. So this is... <laughs> so I've heard the word seniors a lot today. And that's an interesting thing because I, I was told, you know, feel free to be disruptive, but not disrespectful. So I don't know about this senior's word. And who are we talking about? 65-year-olds? Well, one of the craziest things that happened in my career is that I got old myself. So I'm 66 now. And uh, do anybody I know want to become seniors? No. They think of that, that's what my mom or dad or grandparents were. So what are we talking about? Who are we talking about? Good thing to at least reflect on. Uh, I was uh, taken the day that John Glenn announced he was going to be going up into space at 77. And so I was asked by CNN if I would provide commentary about this. And I know Glenn. I've testified be beside him in Washington. He's a very tough guy. Uh, I don't know him personally, but I, I know him a little bit. And so I watched all his first interviews. And all the young reporters were kind of doing the, are you sure you want to do this? You know, well, what's a guy your age doing going up there? And you know, what if your head explodes? And, and I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, what's a geezer doing going into space? So Glenn turned to these young reporters who were kind of hacking at him. And he said, hey, you know what? Just because I'll be 77 doesn't mean I still don't have dreams. That really got me thinking. Because I think we think that young people have hopes and dreams. And then you grow up and you either fulfill them or you don't. And then, you know, you, maybe you can act like a child again for a while. I think what Glenn was saying was something quite provocative to human evolution, which is that if we're going to live a long life, maybe we can have a dream at 50, or a new hope for ourselves at 84, or an aspiration as to what we could become, write our first book of poems, fall in love, run a marathon, get a Nobel Prize at 97. So as you might imagine, over all these decades, I've met many, many, many centenarians and many, many interesting people in their 50s and 60s and 80s. And there is a new model of old emerging. Uh, I just thought I would show you one example. There's many, but here's just one. Volume up a little. This is no Photoshop. So this is one of the more interesting challenges, which is that many of us have a story. Well, my grandmother this and my mom and dad that. Our grandparents and our parents grew old in the past. The future marketplace, there are going to be people growing old in the future. Second point. I think the way we think about life is being altered by longevity. And it's also impacting the marketplace and advertising and 
all sorts of interesting concepts. And, and specifically, I think people are wondering where to put the longevity bonus. Now, historically, you may not have thought about this, but people are inclined to live what I'd call a linear life plan. And the way it worked was is that you knew you had a certain amount of life, and then you had certain obligations, and then there were biologic overlays. And so you learned, you worked, you had some rest, and then you passed away. I have some pictures, actually. You learned, and you learned one time. I remember when I was growing up, the belief was that when you graduate high school or college, or if you got an advanced degree, that would last you till the end of your days. And then the idea was, and by the way, so education was front-loaded. And we also had a theory that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And so older people can't learn. Young people learn, older people don't. And then we believe that you, know, you fell in love and it always lasted to the last breath you took. Uh, and then you divided up the responsibilities. You know, honey, I'll do this, you'll do that. Uh, the kids always turned out perfect. And then right before you die, you took a cruise and that was the package. <laughs> now, if I had the gift of longevity to hand out, if I could give you today a, a year, five, 20, 22, and all you had to do was decide where you were going to put it, I guarantee you, you wouldn't put it at the end. In all my years, I've never had somebody say to me, I like the idea of greater longevity, because I'd like to wait until I'm incontinent, and then also when I've got cognitive impairment, and maybe I've run out of money, and I hope I can have 20 more years of that. And I, I'm being a little bit, um, maybe a lot obnoxious, and I apologize for that, but it's a way to kind of save time. Uh, but yet, that's often the way we think about it, that when you hear about increases in longevity, current and future, because the future is going to be filled with all sorts of amazing things that will cause longevity to keep moving forward, somehow people think that what you're going to do is you're going to live your life exactly the same way, and then you're going to get old and just be old a really long time. Yet, my guess is, if I had asked you where you might want to put those years, you'd distribute them. And that's what everybody's doing. And perhaps that is the biggest change that comes about as a result of longevity. That people now think of a life as a time for new beginnings, for do-overs, for falling in love again, for going back to school, for coming back from a surgical procedure, from I was in a meeting just the other night, and a guy said to me, you know, I've been a dentist my whole life because some 18-year-old drunk version of me thought it'd be a good thing to do. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Most of us have been living lives doing or not doing based on what some young version of us thought we should do to please our parents or make a living or, you know, get going. And it may be that now you've got some other views about all of this. This becomes the model. One of the biggest impacts of this is that our youth culture, we weren't always a youth culture. When in our colonial eras, people, everybody wanted to be old. There were very few older people, but it was believed that older people had wisdom. Uh, they were selected for their divine characteristics. If you remember the signing of the Constitution, everybody wore you know, gray wigs to appear old. But we've been in this youth era since the Roaring Twenties, since the industrial era uh, created, in a, in a way, an industrial divide. Older people were left behind on the farms. Young people went to try the new things. And we might have learned a lesson then, that every time there's a new frontier of technology or work, we want to be sure to bring everybody along. But then when the boomers came along after World War II and modern marketing emerged, we came to the conclusion that you should front load all of your marketing and advertising messaging to people between the ages of about 15 and 25, because that's when they were deciding who they were going to be for the rest of their life. And so it doesn't make any sense to waste marketing or advertising dollars on a 60-year-old because they already know what car they're going to drive and what shampoo they're going to use and what beer they're going to drink and what analgesic they might take. So our whole youth-oriented culture is organized around the idea that this is not what's happening. That people are deciding who they are, and they remain that way for the rest of their life. And therefore, we should or orient our television programs, our direct marketing, our uh, movies. I I've worked a lot in the movie industry. It's organized, as many of you know, around the quadrants, they call them. 
the four quadrants, male, female, young, old. Old is 26. <laughs> and it's believed that people over 55 simply don't matter at all. Or they want to go to a movie in which there's old people in the movie versus a good story or an interesting plot or something that would stimulate or move you. As we reinvent ourselves again and again and again, it means that people are trying new things throughout their lives. They're falling in love and starting households. They're remodeling their homes. They're changing their hairdo. They're learning foreign languages. They're traveling the world. And as we entrepreneurs envision, therefore, what are the market opportunities, we've got to keep that in mind. D retirement within that is also transforming. So here's part of the fun of this. We're trying to be entrepreneurs with new ideas and new technology, but we're trying to keep old still. Old should be the way it used to be. We should reference it at 65. We should call people seniors. When I got in the field, they were called, believe it or not, golden agers. And then this seniors word came along. People thought that was really futuristic. If you go to Webster's Unabridged Dictionary and look up the word retirement, which I have, it says to disappear, <laughs> to go away, to withdraw. So that's an interesting model. We've been doing surveys, AgeWave, for decades now all over the world. And for example, we ask people, boomers, not yet retired necessarily, what's your dream plan for retirement work? And what people say, by the way, all over the world generally is, about 30% of people want to retire old, old school. I'm done. Some people want to work full time, not many. I gave a talk on a college campus not with college students in it a few months ago, and the students cheered for this because they don't want to work full time either. <laughs> so they're thinking, whoever dreamed up that notion of distribution of work against a long life, what most people want is they want to balance. They want to work part time or flex time and try something new or have more time to play or maybe four months a year vacation. And that's an interesting challenge because that means that our corporations are going to have to learn from people like Lyft and Uber, how do you manage logistics better? Because the idea that, oh no, everybody's got to come in the same time is very 20th century. How are we doing so far, by the way? Okay, you guys okay? Um, I think there's a new definition of retirement emerging. People want to be connected. They want to, and by the way, they don't only want to be connected through technology. They want to be connected through touch, through laughter, through involvement, through education, through volunteerism, through work. They want to reinvent themselves. Is Gordon still here from Pixar? Gordon, so this morning Gordon was talking about storytelling, and I am not a children's book storyteller person, but I was a friend of Joe Campbell for years back in the old days, and Joe would talk about how the myths and stories that we learn as we're growing up, in a way, shape the way our lives unfold. They become the tracks of our lives, in a way. And as we were raising our children, we found that, by and large, uh, there weren't old people in the stories, or they were geezers or crones, or they would put you in an oven and eat you. <laughs> and, and by the way, the up story was a beautiful story, but it's a certain kind of story of melancholy, reinvention, intergenerational connection. But the real story, the major story, we think of, trans of, a, of, a, of a longer life and aging is about metamorphosis. So the one children's book we did, it was about a caterpillar dreaming of flying and then turns himself into a butterfly. So a lot of people in your communities that are trying to transform themselves. That's the story. That's the narrative they're struggling with. I used to be a this. How do I become a that? Not, I used to be a this, now I want to be an older, frailer version of that. I might want to try to be somebody different. That's the 21st century narrative that all of us are going to battle and hopefully conquer again and again. And more and more people talk about wanting to have some purpose in their lives. You know, uh, after I'd been in the field a long time, I realized, boy, there's a lot of knowledge out there about what to eat to live longer and how much money you'll need. But I realized that nobody was talking about, like, what for? What is the purpose of being a 90-year-old in this new millennium 
What is the purpose of being 67? Last year, the average retiree watched 49 hours of television a week. That's 2,940 minutes of TV watching. You can't convince me that that is the endpoint purpose of human evolution. Third, to make the story even more active and therefore great for entrepreneurs, not only is longevity changing, and not only are people reconsidering their whole lives and who they are as they live these longer lives, but we've got this other demographic overlay that is really quite uh, opportunistic. Uh, you guys know the story. There was a, during the Depression and the war, birth rates hit an all-time low. Um, and then the boys came home. 92% of all women who could have kids did. They averaged 3.8 kids each. And for the next 18 years, we had this senior boom, baby boom, going to become whatever we decide to call it. But it wasn't just a demographic thing. It was a marketplace phenomenon. Johnson & Johnson, former client of mine, who used to have as their tagline, does anybody remember? Babies are our business, our only business. Why? Because they had the Johnson & Johnson's No More Tear Shampoo. They reintroduced the Band-Aid in 1951. As sidewalks were being laid in suburbia, kids were scraping their knees. They needed to take this institutional wound care product and turn it into the open market. And to this day, you know, they've hit the jackpot on that. By the way, I'll give you one other thought. Boomers are the first generation who grew up with the belief that they should never feel pain. Honestly, our parents and grandparents, yeah, they washed their hair, their eyes burned. Um, we were gonna, so we're a generation that, man, are we not stoic. So, you know, dealing with pain, 100 million people with chronic pain, think about that one for a little bit. I could show you 100 slides like this one. As the boomers migrate across the lifeline, every time they stepped into a new stage of life, some, either by thought or chance, entrepreneurial opportunity took off. So the Gerber's baby food company did not really envision that mothers in this new modern era would want their food pre-configured and put in a little jar, but man, were they happy that that took off. Boomers got a little bit older, and all of a sudden we were outgrowing all of our row houses in Newark or San Diego or St. Louis. And so some people said, what we need to do is to, is to build a new type of living, housing. So we'll take all the farmland outside the cities, and we'll turn it into suburbs with more bedrooms, because these kids are going to want their own bedroom. And um, we'll see what happens. A lot of people said, bad idea, it'll never take off. Property values in those regions grew 500% during that decade. But it wasn't just the homes, it was all the stuff. It was the wear-dated carpeting. Is the, can any of you in this room remember the, um, the Jackie Gleason show, The Honeymooners? What kind of refrigerator did he have in his kitchen? Bang, right. He had no refrigerator. There were no refrigerators before the boomers came along. There were ice boxes. And how did you get your ice? The ice man delivered your ice. Boy, talk about no internet. There was no ice, you know, back then. <laughs> so all of a sudden, middle class affluent families thought that we ought to have all this stuff. And so all these marketplaces went wild. But it kept evolving. Boomers became teenagers. Those of you who are sociologists might appreciate that until this moment in time, that word pretty well didn't exist. And people thought that stage of life was the most miserable stage of life. Nobody wanted to be a young person. Because when you were young, if you think of Holden Caulfield and Catcher in the Rye, or you think of James Dean and Rebel Without a Cause, when you were young, you had no money, you had no power, you, your sexual frustrations were overwhelming, you were rebellious, and you, and you had to come home and sleep in your bed at night. But marketers decided, hey, let's have some fun with this stage of life. Let's make it in. Let's make it cool. Let's make everybody want to be that. Pepsi, for those who think young. Then another example. Used to be people ate their meals at home with their family. That was, a part, that was an institutional way we did things. 
And then there was a guy in his sixth decade of life that sold mixed master blenders diner to diner. And he noticed, because he was in diners, that a lot of these young people seemed to like hanging around with their peers, and they were always in a hurry. So it occurred to him that what the world needed was fast eating restaurants. And people said, you're nuts. We already eat too fast as it is. But you guys know the story. Ray Kroc went out and licensed the McDonald's Brothers hamburgers, and the rest was history. So I've been kept awake almost every night for 40 years, dreaming up what are all the versions of that that are coming. So the average age of the Rolling Stones is now early 70s. They are older than our Supreme Court. <laughs> hey, but I'll tell you what, they can still rock and roll. Uh, so it's like, what are we talking about? We have something in the state of transformation. Longevity, maturity, and then this boomer generation brings its unique, quirky personality characteristics to flavor the story and to populate it. When I switched over from the not-for-profit field to the for-profit field uh, 30 years ago, um, I was taken by the for-profit sector, the idea of valuations, which not-for-profit organizations pay less attention to. And so the notion of growth that if you have a senior center and last year you had 1,000 people and this year you have 1,000 people using your services, you're doing fine. But if you're IBM and you have no growth, your market value drops. I thought, what if you apply that to demography? So I put these charts together of the 1950s. This is the way each demographic segment grew or shrank relative to itself. Obviously, a time of growth of children's related action, whether that's life insurance, kids' toys, Mattel, Hasbro, obviously, 1960s, change, 1970s, 1980s. Let me know if you see a trend forming here. <laughs> 1990s. Here's a decade we just passed. Now I'm going to click this device and show you the way America is reconfiguring between 2000 and 2020. I can't tell you how many CEOs and presidents of countries I have shown this slide to, and they've said, what? We're targeting the millennials. That's where the growth is, and that's who everybody wants to be. So the image I have, it's like you've got this boomer generation, which is a moving cohort, and it's like you've got a 76 million pound elephant that every year is getting you know, one year older, but the way most marketers have pursued the boomer generation is they wait for it to pass, and whatever life stage they used to be in, that's what they target. So they wait for the elephant to pass, and then they try to shoot arrows at its butt. If you really want to hit the jackpot, you get out in front and dig a big hole. There is no market force more predictable than this age wave. None. I thought you might be curious just to see what some other countries look like, so I'll just zip through these. This is Brazil during the same period of time. Canada, China, which had a 400 million person baby boom. Most people aren't aware of that. Uh, France, India, Now, now we're going to look at the marketplace. But before I do that, what I've talked about is we're living in a historically unique moment in time that requires fresh entrepreneurial thinking about the sociology, the mo demography, lives, families, identity, psychology. You know, Eric Erickson, also one of my mentors, Eric wrote this book, you know, the, considered the classic on adult development. He said there were eight stages of life, but five of them were childhood. We haven't even yet created a psychology of longevity. Let me take a look again, just for a few minutes, at this marketplace. First of all, longevity is about more than just health and money. It's about life. And life has got all these different facets, and you know what else? They're moving and changing all the time. For me, one of the biggest challenges is this 
this veil of ageism. And I would say that having worked now in housing and healthcare and long-term care and palliative care and automotive, and who's got the most ageist problems? People who work in the aging field. The field of gerontology is the most ageist because they have seen people who suffer and struggle and who are impoverished, and they imagine that that's the whole thing. Well-intentioned ageism. And then you've got the modern world of media and marketing, which tells you that are you appealing to young, because young is where the money and growth is. Oh, there's layers and layers to it. Even our language. Let's use an example. Um, we met earlier. Uh, remind me your first name? Candice. Candice. If I were to say to you, it's nice to see you, Candice. You're looking uh, very old today. <laughs> that would be seen as an insult. But if I said, Candice, you're really looking young today, you'd probably say thanks. That's an interesting thing. Ageism is 97% of all the physicians who will graduate medical school this year will not have taken one course in geriatric medicine. Do you hear what I'm saying? That even our medical field is ageist. And yet its primary customers, clients, patients are older people, yet how steeped are doctors and nurses in understanding the physiology, the complexity of polypharmacy, this mental state of an older person and their family? Not so good. A Couple of things to help you overcome ageism. First of all, the facts. According to the uh, Federal Reserve Board, it turns out that older people, let's call it 50 plus for today, have most of the money. I think it's really great to target young people, but you need to be really clear, they are broke. <laughs> broke. You can target them with everything you've got. Second, uh, although they're 44% of the adult population, already they're active consumers. My grandparents, having grown up in the shadow of the Depression, were profoundly frugal because they had been traumatized by that economic event. That elder generation were not spenders. Got a whole different cohort in there now. People over the age of 50 represent 53% of airline fares, 57% of new cars and trucks, 59% of lodging, 63% of out-of-pocket health care, 66% of vitamins, 74% of ship fares, and now this is interesting, 85% of magazine subscriptions. Why did I put this one in? Because we want that 70-year-old to pick up their media the way the 23-year-olds do, because we like that. Hey, if they like to read newspapers and magazines, meet them where they live versus berating them for being who they are. What else? Another very interesting ingredient, time. Time affluence. You take a look at most of the stages in life, and people between the ages of 25 and 45 are the most time constrained. But people over who are empty nesters or, or semi or fully retired have tons of time. In fact, another interesting overlay, and then I'll show you a couple of segments, is that we know by studying the aging body that there are changes, circulatory problems, problems with arthritis, the joints. By the way, if you're really clever, you can say, OK, knee problems. That, what are we going to do about knee pain? But also, what about homes that have two stories? They're out. Only 2% of the U.S. housing stock accommodates older bodies appropriately, according to the Harvard studies. So all those little you know, up and down the stairway vehicles, I don't know anybody here is in that business, they're going to make a fortune in the years to come. What else? Orthopedic impairments, and I could just you know, ruin your whole day. Um, <laughs> But I'll give you another example. I was in a meeting with the people from Intel, and this is public information, and they were coming out with yet one more telemedicine alert system. But this one had gyrotonic technology, so it would catch you while you were falling and alert somebody, which I thought was pretty amazing. But you know, disequilibria is a major challenge of aging. One third of the elderly fall each year. So I said, hey, instead of catching people when they fall, why don't you use your technology to make one of those Wii boards so that a 50 and 60 and 70 year old can train themselves up so that they won't fall? 
Or when I go to the gym, why don't you give me some kind of NASA technology with a lightweight suit so that my body can get a training program that will cause me to be super fit and super healthy versus just tell me to use the equipment. Some opportunities, and I'm, gonna, I'm looking at my time, so I'm going to try to stumble my way through this quickly. The healthcare space is obvious. You guys are you know, thinking about this, it's, but it's everything. It's nanotechnologies, it's robotic surgical procedures, it's the stem cell world. It's absolutely captivating to me. Uh, Peter Diamandis and Craig Venter are trying to build a new model for genomic medicine. Uh, you know, the guys at Google and Calico are trying to build a new way to think about health and disease, maybe a different kind of immune attack. It's, it's everything because there's a delta. This is how our bodies are going to be, this is how we wish they would be, and then there's all of that opportunity. What else? This is a field that folks in the aging field are uncomfortable with because we think it's a disrespectful commentary, and it might be, but I have watched this space just multiply. So, for example, years ago, I was fascinated by the uh, cycle dog food industry, how you were formulating nutrient blends to match the age of a dog. So when the sentient people called us up and said, what should we do? We formulated a vitamin supplement to match an older body, and that was sentient silver. And I know many of you think, oh, there's only tiny little opportunities in this business world. There's billion-dollar businesses that have been built off of the aging of our population. Many, many, many. I could share 50 of them with you. What else is coming? You know what else? I take vitamins. It's kind of a random exercise, a little of this, a little of that. Why don't you put a biolab in my toilet so that in the morning I get a prescription, and rather than just creating a smoothie blend, I can turn this and it will filter into my smoothie drink exactly those vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and phytochemicals to make me optimally well. All the technology exists. They're doing it in Japan. Where's the ideas? What else? Food and beverage. Whether it be adding nutraceuticals, whether it be coming up with less unhealthy foods. And I'll tell you that Quaker was a client of mine, but it was Pepsi that acquired Quaker, and that was all about the age wave. Because at that point, Pepsi was largely Frito-Lay and drinks and beverages, salty snacks, caffeinated, carbonated drinks. And so when they understood the demography that was coming, they acquired Quaker Oats. You probably didn't think of that as a maturity play. It was. What are the opportunities in the world of food, beverages, nutrients? Hasn't even begun. Financial service, major, major, major zone of opportunity. Uh, most people have no clue how much they should be saving. They don't know exactly who they can trust. All the kind of you know, retirement calculators are based on yesterday's model of longevity. Uh, but if you look at people 50 plus, 71% of all the money in the savings institutions, 76% of all US net worth, and 78% of the funds in retirement accounts. I would encourage you to consider at some point, is there an opportunity here for some sort of business, service, tech, app, information, something? Housing. It's everything. It's the fact that people are remodeling. 55% of all the remodeling dollars last year in America were spent by people over the age of 55. And if you look at all the home repair remodeling shows, they've all got young people in them. And then there's making homes more aging friendly. And then there's the later in life, sort of in the 75 or 80 or 85 plus years, yet another housing set of circumstances that might be more similar to assisted living, long-term care. What are the breakthroughs that are going to happen in that zone? And as many of you have been pitching, great ideas. How do we cause people to be more secure, uh, respected, comfortable, and engaged? But that's not the same as what a 61-year-old is contemplating. The people at Milliken have done some great work on this. They point out that when you're creating a community for young families, you go in a certain direction. But if we're accommodating uh, longer-lived people, the people want their communities to be safe and secure. They want to feel a sense of community, interactivity. They want to be able to learn and have the cultural or social activities that stimulate them. They want a vibrant but affordable economy. They want to be able to work and volunteer. 
They got to be able to ex get access to transportation. My dad lost his vision. He needed to be driven everywhere. Some people have low vision. Here's an example. At the age of 80, it takes three times longer for the eyes to adjust to light changes as the age of 20. So how come we don't have smart glass in every single automobile in the world? So that I can punch in what my vision characteristics are. So when I'm coming around a bend, if there's glare, the glass responds. You know, even our hearing devices. Your auditory range and character is different, yet we all are working with the same phones, and how do we know we can hear them clearly? Where are the apps for that? There are a few, but you can't think of which ones they are. And people want excellent health care. Got a couple of more points to make. Leisure and entertainment. Why do I put Bill O'Reilly up here? Because the average age of his viewers is 76. Fox News was a longevity play. Rupert Murdoch was a client of mine. He knew what he was doing. He knew that you can compete for the young population, or you can get those older people with their politics and their attitudes and their desires and build a network for them. Average age of Fox viewers is 65 years old. Fox News. But all the things that people might do in their free time. Theater, I went to see last week, my wife and son, we went to see Hamilton in New York. And I got to tell you, it was like an AARP convention. <laughs> that was not a young crowd. I'm almost done. In the next 20 years, there will be 2.5 trillion hours of free time to be filled. 2.5 trillion hours of free time to be filled. What do boomers want more over the next stage of life? They want to have fun. Almost at the end, we're going to see the travel industry explode. And far away, expensive travel, but also local travel. How do you go visit a friend's house or a cousin's in another city and learn to take in a different part of the world? Last point I'm going to make. A contribution, I apologize, I've run a little long. Uh, I throw this in as an extra. And I'd like to show you one clip of an application of technology to helping people contribute. And then I'm going to tie all this together and welcome Jody. Volume up. Not all of our students have the chance to travel abroad and to interact with native speakers of English. And we're always asking ourselves, how can we make it more real, more human? connects our students with seniors in the USA living in retirement homes. Hello. Hello, hello. Melissa. Hi, Dick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? How are you today? I'm good. How are you? It's, it's the I, first uh, time that I'm talking with someone from another, another country. I'm very excited to be doing this. I look like I'm only 25, but, but I'm, I'm 88. <laughs> I live with my old brother. He has 23 years. Do you know, instead of saying he has 23 years, you could say he is 23 years old. I tried to go to Lulapalooza that we have next week, I think, in Brazil, but my mom didn't let me. Uh, you got a good mom. <laughs> good morning, dear Julia. Good morning to you. This is your dad? That's me and my wife when we were young. Oh, you were good looking when you were young. And you're still good looking. <laughs> if you could just dream and have whatever you want, what, would, what do you think you would like to be doing? I see myself in big family, you know with a beautiful wife. You know? I want to thank you for this change of experience, you know. You are incredible. Abracado. You are my new granddaughter, and I love you. I love you too. And if you were here, I would give you a big hug. Oh yeah, let's hug. Oh. Bye. Bye. So on this last, yeah, yeah. 
On this last point, we're talking about the marketplace and the economy. There's also the giving economy. Retirees currently contribute 42% of all volunteer hours and 45% of all dollars given. Because the number of retirees is going to grow by 57% over this next decade, even keeping today's dollars, what you're going to see is a massive amount of volunteer hours contributed, an uh, extraordinary amount of charitable donations given by older adults. It's going to be an $8 trillion longevity bonus. And I don't know how many of you have thought about the whole world of philanthropy and contribution and purposeful giving and encore volunteering, but it is about to go wild. So to conclude, uh, we're living in a time of increasing longevity. Um, there are new paradigms for how people are contemplating each stage in life with opportunities to kind of do it over or try something new. This age wave is going to layer in growth like we've never seen before in the older adult population. And there's a marketplace that's emerging and it is so big, it is so opportunistic that you can't even begin to imagine what's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years. But that's what we're here for. So thank you guys for being so patient. Hopefully I've given you a few things to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So uh, some reflections. Um, well, first of all, well, uh, Ken, thank you. Uh, once again, uh, masterful. I mean, the things that just kind of roll off your tongue, uh, I, I'm just, you know, still Thank striving you. for. Thank you. Um, so there to were, look forward uh, to as you age. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, know, you only got a couple of years on yeah. me, buddy. <laughs> so um, there were three things uh, that really stood out to me in, in, your, uh, in your comments. And... Um, and I, and I wanted to uh, just also uh, just share uh, one factoid. So we've just done a, we're, we're in the final stages of updating our longevity economy study. And, um, and what you have there is a third of the population total, not just the adult population, but a third of the total population, people over 50, who are generating almost 50% of total US GDP. Right. The number's now 7.1. $7.6 trillion. Uh, and I always say numbers that end in B or T, uh, take notice. Um, the other uh, thing that, that jumped out at me more than any of the data were three words. Dreams, Dreams. life, and fun. Those lenses are so rarely looked through in many market segments, but especially this market segment. And I would suggest to the entrepreneurs in, in, in the audience that if you are not including that at least as an overlay for all your other market analysis, you're, you're really uh, missing out. Um, and then I had some other reflections. And that is that Ken and Mary uh, have, and they've poo-pooed me on this, but they, I've, I've said this for several years now, once I really understood um, this space, this aging space. And that is that I stand on the shoulders of giants. One of them is sitting here, and I'd like to bring out the other one, Mary, come here. <laughs> because um, I realized that um, Ken and I were on stage uh, together, or sequentially, about five years ago on, on the stage. I think it was back then. We were sitting right there, yeah. And um, OK, let's see if this is going to work. But I, I realized that nobody had ever put the two of these people together and really given them the recognition as oh, being, being get to win the war. boomer market <laughs> trailblazers. That's fine. <laughs> well, we should bow. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> and uh -oh, and, and I wanted to give you oh, your, 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 no. your two, you know, customized. <laughs> no, this is quite. But I, but I, but I, 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 I say this. This is very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of funny because I once visited Ken's house and I looked at his garden and I said, I should have let you negotiate more of my deals. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. And I'm sure this was very, very bitter. Richard Adler, Dan, for a long time. You. Surprise. You're a clever guy. <laughs> clever guy. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, while, while we have a couple, a couple more minutes, um, so you, you went through a whole list of, of different market sectors uh, where the opportunity is. When, when you're looking out there, and a, and a lot of those are going to be big companies. Right, and, and you, you made this point in a conversation we had. It's not only the startups, but large corporations, which is your primary client base, uh, they're, they're aware of this. Who's doing it well, big or small? First, a context answer, and then I'll tell you who I think. So years ago, there was a basketball player, Muggsy Bogues, yep. who's a short guy, but a great athlete. And could dunk. Yeah. He could jump, he could fly. People say to him, how do you play with all those tall guys? He says, I don't play the tall guy game, I play the close to the floor game. And years ago, when I've written 16 books. When Age Wave came out in 1989, I was on the cover of Inc. Magazine and then Fortune Magazine and stuff like that. And I got to speak at both of their conferences. And the Fortune people, you, they'd hear the ideas and they'd say, we have a management retreat next fall, maybe you come. But the Inc. people, they went right out of the room, on the phone, sending messages, taking action. And I think those are the two sort of rhythms of, of capitalism in our country. You got the slower, more lumbering, more bureaucratic, big companies, but they've got capacity, they've got capital, they've got scale, they've got distribution, but they can't think creatively and they're frightened of losing their jobs and they're, you know, they're kind of in their own mm -hmm. trance. Then you've got all the creatives out here who can't necessarily manage the billion dollar company or it's not there, but the, the ability to invent and create. And I think that we need each other. I think that these two sides of the capitalistic uh, dance are required to thrive. Um, so when I sat here this morning and heard these pitches and hear all the things you guys did, I'm thinking, these are great. I mean, these are great. And can you, I mean, has that got scale? If you've got a capability and it works, you know, for example, I was with Silveride last night. So let's say that works in two cities. Well, that could work in 300 cities. Mm -hmm. So how does one find the right partner? Uh, and the big companies I've been struck by over the years, how there is just a real reluctance to innovate. They might say they want to, but it's just not their nature. Um, so they bring in McKinsey's or Bain's or BCG's or people like yourselves who have ideas. And then if there's a right formula, who's doing it well? I think most of the companies doing it well, you wouldn't think of as doing it well. So when all the mattress companies came out and, you know, back this and back that, they put young adults in their ads, but I knew their marketplace, they were going after older people, uh, you know, snoring older people. Um, you know, the Celebrex when it came out, the analgesic world, and the Proxim Sodium, the Leaf, Procter & Gamble understands what they're doing. Um, Mercedes understands who their marketplace is. Lexus understands who their marketplace is. We think it's only going to be the, oh, you mean the elderly company or the senior something. But there are, I'll give you an example. There was one up there. I, w I was brought in to work with Anheuser-Busch because they were very distressed over the fact that an aging population is very bad news for the beer industry because guys have really small prostate glands when, they, you know, when they're young and they could drink beer and sleep it off. Older guys. So I sat there with Augie Bush, and he said to me, you think these guys still want to, people over 50 want to drink beer? I said, yeah, they do, just not as much. He said to his son, who was head of marketing, do we have any of our brands that we don't have to start from scratch, people recognize the name, we could relaunch it? Yeah, Michelob, it's kind of dead. So Augie said to me, well, what should we do? I said, try something. What would you call it? I said, don't give it a Michelob granny or Michelob mm. old. How about ultra? And what would we do to it? Take out the carbs and calories. It was the most successful beer relaunch in history. You probably didn't think of that 
as a 40 or 50 plus targeted mm -hmm. food product. Um, Partly the problem is the ageism, which you so astutely, Mary, in the session yesterday pointed out, that if you bring products to market and specifically refer to them as products for older people, they'll think it's for somebody 10 to 15 years older than them. That's just the way we do it in this society, that if I'm 60, I don't want to be shown something that's really for an 80-year-old. Um, we prefer to aspire towards the younger side. So who else is doing it? Well, I think your organization is, you know, is serious uh, player, uh, AARP. When AARP puts out an endorsement or an affiliation, people take it seriously. Um, I, um, I don't know how you cope with, that would be my question, but I'll say one more, and I don't know how you cope with it, but how does one be a big organization like that and also create this entrepreneurial engine that you're a part of? Um, who else is doing it well? I think that... Um, I have so many examples. That, that's partly the problem. In terms of the senior world, I like, you know, I saw the Home Instead people here. I think Paul and Lori Hogan had a good idea, and they're doing a nice job growing it out. Biggest challenge, of course, is they can't find more caregivers. So how do we populate the world of low-paid low people to care for all these older people? And technology, you know, you look at Lori Orloff, what she's working on. I think there's so much intelligence but it's not necessarily gathered, it's not congregated. We don't, you and I have never sat down and said for 10 hours we're just gonna like, what are all the ideas that are yep. gonna happen? We're all kind of, it's So it's can we much, get that on the uh, calendar? Sure, okay. <laughs> uh, just too much bits and pieces. I think there's the, the next wave revolution, kind of like what Aging 2.0 is doing with entrepreneurs, but I've seen more success and at this stage of my life, I'd be more inclined to go the uh, entrepreneurial route, because I'd rather deal with, we've got all the capital we need for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth rounds, we got distribution ready to go, boom. You know, when we came up with Tylenol arthritis, six months later that was a billion dollar product. And that would have been a really hard thing to try to grow as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So you probably wouldn't think Tylenol arthritis was a 50 plus play. Uh, it was. No, I would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now especially that we got a little aches and pains. So. Yeah. So, so um, it, you, you raise the issue of caregiving, a uh, huge focus of AARPs. Uh, we have a, a research consortium of us, United Healthcare, Robert Wood Johnson, Pfizer, MedStar Health, all looking at, at, at caregiving. Our you know, forecast is there's going to be a gap by 2020 of 117 million people in need of some type of care but only roughly 50 million caregivers available, 45 million unpaid, and an additional 5 million paid caregivers. So huge gap. Technology has to play some role. Looking really further out, thinking about dreams, fun, and life, what's that future? So uh, I don't... I don't look at it exactly this way, so let me show you how I look at it. I see that a, uh, when, I was, when I was 30, I did a book with Jonas Salk, and we talked mm -hmm. about, are we going to have more iron lungs back in the 40s? I wasn't alive then. Or are we going to wipe out this disease? If we could wipe out Alzheimer's and related dementias, we wouldn't have so many elder people uh, in, in eight to 10 years of cognitive decline needing of caregivers. Second, uh, over the age of 75, 52% of the American public lives alone. Somehow, after World War II, we got this idea that people are, as a show of independence, uh, you should have your own house, your own apartment. I think if people were more likely to co-house and to have roommates and housemates, and I think if we could wipe out Alzheimer's, that the need for caregivers would alter dramatically in the future. Nevertheless, in this period between now and then, technology has got to fill that gap. All the sorts of technologies that I'm hearing here today, and there's a lot of, I would say, in fact, when I come away, a lot of attention on that zone. How do we get the information back and forth? How do we have people have reminders? How do we engage people, keep them connected with their grandchildren in the, in the outside world without having to have a nurse drive to the house and spend 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. And um, But nobody's really cracked that code big style yet. So everybody's trying to build the operating system or the mechanism that United picks up. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so I'd rather see a diminished need for long-term caregiving by fixing the problems 
But in between now and then, the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see a lot of uh, need for technology filling that gap. For, for me, the, t the touch point is, is Star Trek. I start with Star Trek. I go to sleep with Star Trek. I'm kind of weird that way. I'm, I'm, um, the, I, I'm you know, toe to toe. But, you know, first Bluetooth communicator, 1965, Lieutenant Uhuru, right? First, first tablet, 1988, Picard reading Shakespeare in his office, right? The tricorder. I'm now we you. got the X Prize and Peter Diamandis and Qualcomm, $10 million. By the way, for startups, that is too much money. Um, what else? Um, and then, and then voice, ups. and then, and then voice recognition, right? Just where, where I think Echo and Amazon have it right, is that once you take the friction out of trying to find that button to push, that's typically a black button on a black background with a two-point font, black yeah. typeface, um, and you know, which I don't think even my children can read, let alone me. Um, once you can just say it into the air, you know, make me my Earl Grey tea, you know. So can I respond yeah. to that? So many, many years ago, there were a group of us who felt that doorknobs were really ineffective because if you were an elder person, you had arthritis, doorknobs are very difficult to work. But then we thought, well, if you're young and you're carrying a baby, you've got a bag of groceries. So there was a movement towards what we called universal design. Mm -hmm. And notice now almost all environments have door levers. Um, most of our world has not been designed to be comfortable or accommodating to people over the age of 50 or 60. Uh, Two-thirds of people over 50 wear bifocular lenses, so if you go to the supermarket, you look in the lower shelf, you can't see anything. Or you're getting off a bus and you're going to fall because it's a blur. We haven't thought about that. Buttons in the back of a woman's dress are not designed for a woman who's had a mastectomy or who's single. How do you do that? So it's not just the tech devices. Mm -hmm. It's all of it. And um, how do we make it more accommodating? Going to voice would clear that interim period of trying to match people up with technology they can't feel or touch or use easily. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. We're going to have to leave it there. Our award winner is okay. hastening us.